Welcome. Thank you for coming to this session. My name is Cooper Linton. I'm the Associate Vice President for Duke Home Care, Hospice, and Home Infusion. I also have spent a number of years as a caregiver, taking care of my own loved ones and within my immediate family and some extended. And in the spirit of transparency for the next 20 to 30 minutes, I would like to try and blend what I've learned in my professional life with what I have learned from my own experiences in my personal life. So I appreciate your willingness to bear with me on that. And I hope that it may not feel like a conversation because unfortunately we can't be in the same room together. But I hope that some of what you'll hear will resonate with you and cause your thoughts to come forward and it'll be as close to a conversation as we can have while maintaining the social distances that we need. The idea of this is to have hoping and curing and healing, and then there's this weird subtitle about recycling. We'll get to that in a minute, but hoping and curing and healing, let's just jump right in. If you would, I'd, I'd like for you to consider taking hoping and curing and healing and holding them in your mind in a way that's similar to what you see on the screen in a Venn diagram, these three overlapping circles. They all touch each other, but there's this sweet spot in the middle where we can hope for things and cure things and heal things all at one time. We get all three at once. For most of our lives, curing and healing really are the same. For most of our life, we've been able to get sick and we get well and we return to a wellness, even a wholeness, that was just as good as it was before we got sick. And we may have seen our loved ones go through a similar journey where they may have a decline, but they rebound. But as we age, we realize that these circles really are separate and we may not always be able to stay in that beautiful sweet spot right in the middle of those three circles. Something we have to consider there. So I want us to talk for a moment about recycling. And so what does that have to do with this? Well, as a caregiver, we may find that we have to renew ourselves, reform ourselves into something different as our understanding of curing and healing changes, it may also change what we hope for, what we hope for for ourselves and what we hope for for our loved ones. I would like to share a couple of stories with you where I found myself having to recycle. And I should probably start with explaining that my mother loved recycling. I can't tell you why. But she did. She loved to collect cans and she would get, be sure they were all properly sorted in, in the bins. And I think part of it for her was just trying to take care of the world we're in. But she inadvertently taught me a different lesson in that. So I'll share a couple of stories. One is that about 10 years ago, my mother and father were both living here in Durham. Mom was the primary caregiver of my father who was materially older than she was. And I was in the background. I was supporting mom as mom took care of dad. But in this particular situation, mom got sick and mom couldn't take care of dad. And I found myself going from a supporting role to being the hands-on caregiver. And this particular evening, I found myself in their house. And my father, as simple as it sounds, seemed overwhelmed by heating a bowl of soup that night. Dad needed supper, so I got focused on warming up a bowl of soup. And with my attention on Dad and dinner, I lost track of Mom. In fact, we both lost track of Mom. Mom wasn't anywhere in the house to be found, and my anxiety level began to climb. I didn't know a whole lot about caregiving, but I knew if you lost your loved one, that was bad. So we needed to figure out something. And I heard cans out in the garage, cans being rattled around. My father was nearest the door, 
from the kitchen to the garage. I said, Dad, would you look in the garage and see if Mom's there? Absolutely. And he opens the door. Honey, are you out there? To which she cheerfully replied, No, dear, I'm not. He closes the door, turns to me and says, Son, I have no idea where she is. She's not out there. She just said so. Well, it's kind of funny, but in the moment it wasn't. In that moment, I realized that I needed to recycle myself. When my mom was working on the cans, I think she had those handled, but I needed to recycle myself and realign my own hopes. I was now in the business of caring for two people, not supporting one person. Now, if you can fast forward again about from that event another six years, Mom, my father has passed, and my mother has a form of, of dementia called amyloid angiopathy. It's a degenerative form of dementia. And not only had it begun to steal from her her cognition, it had begun to rob from her her mobility. She was no longer safe on her feet. She was unsteady. She needed the assistance of a cane or a walker. Uh, she was in, just struggled with balance. And the thing that we hated most was stairs. Stairs seemed to be the bane of our existence. Once again, I'm in that same kitchen with my mother. And I did one of the great sins of caregiving. I took a moment to go to the bathroom. We've all probably done that. And I, when I come back, <clears throat> once again, mom's gone. Now I'm thinking to myself, now I've lost mom twice. It's been a number of years apart, but now I've lost her again. And this time also I heard the sound of cans rattling in the recycling bin out in the garage. I opened the same door, looked down. <clears throat> Mom has gone down the steps into the garage and she is sorting the recycling. She got down there safely, almost a miracle in that. I went to the bottom of the steps and I said, Mom, we got to quit recycling. we got to quit fooling with coming down these stairs and fooling with the cans. She said, you're right, dear. She was always very cheerful, very agreeable, totally non-compliant. Wasn't going to pay attention to me. I said, Mom, we've got to quit going down the stairs. You're going to get hurt. She said, yeah, you're right. I am. If I keep going down the stairs, I'm going to get hurt. And I realized it still hadn't sunk in. So I was going to be more forceful this time. And I said, Mom. You can't go down the stairs anymore. You're going to fall and you're going to break your butt. To which she replied, oh dear, it shouldn't be all that hard. I hear there's already a crack right in the middle of it. Mom won. <laughs> That's funny to me. But in the moment, I was also exasperated. I wasn't quite sure where to go from there, but I knew I needed to recycle again. Again, mom had the cans sorted out. It was me that needed to be recycled. I needed to adjust my hopes for what she wanted. What she wanted for herself was different than what I wanted for her. And if I think back to those three circles, I needed to adjust my hopes I also needed to adjust my understanding of curing and healing. This was not going to get better. We were going to be on a journey that only had one destination. So I hope that besides silly stories about tin cans, the concept of self-recycling may resonate with you as we begin to reposition curing and hoping and healing on our own personal Venn diagrams. Now, I, this next slide I don't want you to think is too weird. Life, the ultimate sexually transmitted illness, it's not going to be that kind of presentation. It's 1996, and I'm a new graduate, and I'm working in a home health agency. And I realized that they were going to form a hospice. And I was curious about hospice. I knew very little about home health. I knew even less about hospice. And so I went to the most experienced nurse I could find. Please note, nurses never get old. 
but some of them become quite experienced. And this nurse was very experienced. And I went to her and I said, I don't understand this hospice thing. And she said, son, which in the South means you're about to be schooled. Son, life is a sexually transmitted terminal illness. You've caught it, now move along. She had no patience in that moment for any failure to recognize the terminal condition of humanity. Well, I thought she was kind of blowing me off in the moment, but it took me a while to realize she was actually trying to make a point. It took me several years, actually, to grasp it. There is an inherent terminal condition to being human. We're not going to outlive it. It's a false belief to think we're going to perpetually be healed, that we're always going to return to our previous level of wellness. And in spite of our hopes, dreams, and expectations for our loved ones, they're not always going to return to full wellness either. And so if we can accept the reality of the human condition having a terminal end, we also have to shift our hopes as caregivers. Realistically, we have to embrace our own human frailty. Or as some have said, we're not going to make it out of this alive. So I want us to think about that for a moment. There really is no cure for the human condition. We do the best we can, but we have great limitations there. It also causes us to stop and think about the people that we love in a different light. How do we define people besides the accumulative list of their illnesses? Now, we're quick to list out all the maladies we may be dealing with. And as a caregiver, your calendar probably reflects all the many appointments, the myriads of tests that you have to go to. And it seems like your life and maybe the life of your loved one becomes defined by their diagnoses. If you think about it in our language, we often use that language. So-and-so is a diabetic. Well, they're a person who has diabetes. I don't think we need to define them fully that way. This word has fallen from use, thankfully. But if we go back, we used to refer to someone who was bedbound as an invalid or invalid. Thankfully, that term has fallen from use, but it speaks to the way we have looked at aging as if it diminishes the person and the value that they have. We are more than the sum of our illnesses, at least I hope that I am, and I hope that you are too. But it does make us start to question, when do we set healing aside and allow curing Excuse me, let me say that again. When do we set curing aside and allow healing to take precedence? Healing can become far more important than curing. In our curing, we realize we have, very limited, we have great limitations on what success means. Things that we can't control can steal the capacity for curing from us. And then what happens to our hope? Heard a man say years ago, and I don't know if that was originally a man that said it, but it was a man that said it to me. He said that stress is not the presence of pressure. It is the absence of hope. It stuck with me. I want to say that again for you because, well, it stuck with me. Stress is not the presence of pressure, but rather the absence of hope. How do we take the pressure, the stress of being a caregiver, and realign that by adjusting our hopes for things that we may be able to handle, such as healing and aligning care around the healing of an individual as opposed to an impossible task of curing. Palliative medicine is an area that I believe strongly in. Obviously, I work in the realm of hospice. And let me preface that 
all of hospice is palliative care, but not all palliative care is hospice. There is breadth, there's a breadth to palliative medicine that extends beyond simply the limitations of hospice. And we'll, we'll unpack that for a moment. But I've heard it said that palliative care is, is um, an alternative to getting treatment. I really struggle with that because palliative medicine can be used to augment treatment. It can be used to provide care concurrently with treatment. It's not an alternative to treatment at all. It is a different way of delivering care focused more for some people on pain and symptom management, but I think there's far more to it. But if in fact it is an alternative to treatment, the focus on palliative care is around what are the individual goals of a patient? What, is, what do they want? What do they want for themselves? What do they want for their loved one? I guess my question is, when did that become an alternative part of treatment? Shouldn't that be a part of all of our care? Is to understand what we want at the end of this treatment regimen. Palliative medicine can do a lot more than simply focus on pain or on symptoms. For one thing, it deals with compassion and candor the things we're afraid to talk about. That sexually transmitted terminal illness called life can become front and center. We can discuss it openly. We can talk about the impact of treatment openly and can share that conversation with our loved ones. There's liberation in taking the unspoken and putting it out there, no longer letting it live in the shadows. Understanding quality of life, well, that's different for each person. My idea of a quality of life may be vastly different from yours, but it doesn't matter because it's only your vote that counts on this. What do you want for you or what does your loved one want for themselves? And you may have to be the voice for that person in some situations. How do we make sure that the care aligns with our goals? not the goals of the people that are doing the treating, the goals of the patient, of our loved one. And does that cause us to think as caregivers about realigning where hope fits in that Venn diagram? We keep going back to that. I mentioned a few moments ago about the, the cluttered calendar of doctor's appointments the lab tests and the images and all the things that seem to take up the life as we get older of a, and, and as our loved one becomes more frail, we find all these things happening that are medical appointments. How do we coordinate that into one fabric? Maybe that fabric can wrap around the person we love and actually provide comfort in the concept of palliation, of palliative care. I put pain and symptom management last on this list, not because I don't think it's the most important, but because I think we sometimes only look at palliative medicine for pain and symptom management. We don't look at the larger spectrum of what it can do. Treating the whole person, understanding what they want, coordinating care, aligning that care with the goals that we have. That has to be at least as important as pain and symptom management. I would like to think that pain and symptom management are actually part of the treatment for every person with or without palliative medicine. So this brings us to the idea of hoping and healing. Well, what happens when curing is not an option at all? We're no longer pursuing any kind of treatment that's related to curing. Well, that's when hospice becomes a very valid option. It's not for everybody, but for those that really want to walk away from the idea of any pursuit of cure and to be focused really on wellness, wholeness, healing, quality of life, time with their loved ones, and a reduction of pain and symptoms, hospice is 100% palliative care. 
and it provides in-home supports for people when they may want to stay at home. The overwhelming majority of hospice care is actually delivered where people call home. Yes, there are inpatient hospice facilities, and Duke has one, but most of our patients are at home, where they say they want to be, which is also where the people that they love live. So I'd ask you to consider hospice as an option within that journey as we begin to align hoping and healing, and we've recognized that the circle that had cure on it has now faded. It's lost its relevance. But healing, healing is always in vogue. It's never lost its relevance. I'll share with you just a few closing thoughts on this. We think about healing all the time. We use that word, but in its most sincere form. Well, it matters most when curing isn't even in the picture. And what we hope for may have to realign as caregivers. When curing goes away, healing remains we have to recycle ourselves based on a hope for healing. Because as caregivers, we have to be able to continue beyond caring for our loved one. That healing is critical not only for our patients, but it's absolutely critical to us as caregivers, whether we're professional or whether we're caring for a loved one in our family. We have to be healed and whole as well as this journey continues. So let's be honest, there's no cure for what we have. I'm on a terminal trajectory as is everybody else I know. We have all caught that sexually transmitted illness of life. I get that. So let's start thinking about aligning our hopes with curing and healing. and Let's start that today. And as for recycling, mom would appreciate it if you'd pick up a can or two. Thank you for your time.